Welcome back. Before we get started, think about what does the mitochondria do? Which types of cells have mitochondria? Well, in my experiment, I had one that got full sun, one that got partial sun, and one that actually, I'm going to turn this off, was in the dark. So what do you think might have happened? I had the same amount of water, and let's see what it shows in this simulation. So after 30 days, you should see some growth. And even the plant in the dark did grow. But as you can tell, the plants in the light, the partially sun and the full sun, grew a lot taller than the plants in the dark. Now, this wasn't necessarily what I got from my experiment, but why are we learning about photosynthesis? And how does that connect to our experiment? Well, there you go, right? We know plants need light for photosynthesis. What else do plants need for photosynthesis? That's right, they need water. So maybe your experiment was actually different amounts of water. And the same, right? And then keeping the light all the same, right? Because you have to have your controlled variables. Okay, again, photosynthesis connects in that way because water is an input. You could have also done the type of soil because there's other nutrients that plants need. How does cellular respiration connect to our experiments? Well, of course, plants do cellular respiration, but the yeast and the animal and the bird experiments actually connect even closer. So it, the science of baking sourdough requires some yeast. And if you get yeast that's active enough and you feed it with flour, then you can actually create bubbles, which is the carbon dioxide. So because the yeast is doing cellular respiration, that's actually what makes your bread rise. That's what makes your bread fluffy. So if you look at some of these examples of yeast experiments, you know, the taller the bread, uh, the fluffier the bread is, the more active the yeast was, which means the yeast was doing a lot of cellular respiration. There were a lot of little yeast cells actively eating the flour or the sugar and making carbon dioxide. There's a lot of different ways you could show this and measure this. You could test different types of flour to see how, how you can grow yeast. You can e even do an experiment using a yeast balloon, which is really interesting. If you have your starter, your three different starters, and you put them all in, in the same type of container, and you put a balloon over each of them, and let it go for a while, you can actually use that balloon to test how much carbon dioxide is produced, how much cellular respiration is happening. And you'll notice that the ones that have bigger balloons actually have more yeast um, being active and doing cellular respiration. So how does that actually connect to the animals though, the bird experiments? Well, for cellular respiration, we know the input is sugar and oxygen. So the food they're actually feeding the birds is made up of sugar. In the case of the hummingbird, you're either putting fructose or sucrose. So sucrose and fructose, fructose is basically the sugar from um, fruits. So if you're putting out fruits for your birds, that's fructose. Um, if you are using sucrose, that's like table sugar, sugar that you would bake with or add to your tea. And actually, if you look at the diagram, those two sugars are just basically just a larger um, version or a different version of glucose. And so glucose, again, is the input of cellular respiration. So the birds need to eat it in order to survive. Well, what if you are working with birds with seed? Well, the same thing is true. So instead of just sugar, sugar water, you're actually feeding the birds starch. So seeds or um, other parts of plants like leaves and um, stems, those are all forms of starch. And so if you look at the starch molecule, you'll see that starch is just a bunch of glucose molecules uh, combined together. 
And so again, the input of cellular respiration is glucose. So you're feeding the birds in order for them to do cellular respiration. So now that we've made a connection between our experiments and the other things we've been learning in class, it's time to talk about our culmination, what we've been preparing for this whole term. So remember, there's a call for submissions to the Millennium Scientific Journal. And actually, everyone in the school is going to be submitting a paper to this journal at the end of this term. Our deadline is May 22nd, so now is a great time to jump in and really get started. So the manuscript, the paper you're writing, has a bunch of different necessary components. Some are pretty simple, like a title, right? Um, some are a little bit more complicated. So today we're going to go through an example of a manuscript of a scientific paper, and we're going to look at the different components to give you a sense of what yours can look like. So at this stage, go ahead and pause the video and open up the link to this article uh, in the Google Doc. Reading the article out loud with you, and as we go through it together, keep an eye out for the different components that you need to include in your paper. So this is real research that came out January 2020. So the title is Can Graphene in Your Clothing Stop Mosquito Bites? And the authors are listed below. So let's start with the abstract. Wouldn't it be great if there was clothing out there that could fully protect us from mosquito bites? This could reduce itching and the spread of mosquito-borne diseases. To find out, we tested whether a super thin but really strong substance, graphene, has the potential to make clothing mosquito-proof. In, our lab, in a lab experiment, we exposed humans wearing A, no protection, or B, cheesecloth, or C, cheesecloth plus graphene to mosquitoes. And we found that the graphene indeed kept mosquitoes from biting people. We were surprised to realize that it not only acted as a physical barrier for the insect's mouth parts, but also blocked important chemical signals that mosquitoes use to detect humans. Under dry conditions, our graphene layer therefore showed double potential for protection. However, sweat or water made it less mosquito-proof. But we found a modified form, reduced graphene, that protected humans even when it was wet. Introduction. Mosquito bites are not just a nuisance, but can come with serious consequences. No other bite kills more humans or makes us more sick. Mosquitoes serve as the most important vector for many infectious diseases. People frequently use chemicals to protect themselves from mosquitoes. However, these chemicals can have many unpleasant side effects, both for humans and the environment. People are also advised to wear long clothes to protect themselves from getting bitten. However, mosquitoes have a very sophisticated biting apparatus made out of six super skinny needles and saws which allows them to bite through some clothing and, of course, our skin. We wanted to know if we could add a non-toxic nanomaterial to clothes that would make them impenetrable for mosquitoes. A good candidate seemed to be graphene, a material made out of carbon in very thin sheets that has already been being used on clothing for various other applications to make them UV protective or bulletproof, for instance. However, no one has ever tested if this material could be used for mosquito protection. We conducted a couple of experiments with live humans and live mosquitoes, coupled with some mathematical calculations to figure this out. Methods. For our lab experiments, we recruited volunteers who agreed to be bitten by 80s AGFD mosquitoes in a controlled setting. The mosquitoes we, had, we used had to have been bred in a sterile lab conditions and did not carry any diseases. The volunteers exposed a small patch of skin on their arm or hand, roughly 100 mosquitoes for five minutes at a time in a modified plexiglass glove box. Figure one. We tested three different scenarios in a randomized order. Mosquitoes on naked skin, skin covered in cheesecloth, skin with a thin graphene layer, and then covered in cheesecloth. We then recorded and quantified the behavior of the mosquitoes whether they landed on skin, how long they stayed there, and whether they started to suck blood with a video camera. We also counted how many bites each volunteer received in all these scenarios based on the number of swellings that developed on the skin afterwards. 
Finally, we observed what happened if we dripped a little water or sweat on top of the cheesecloth, and we also tested a slightly different version of our graphing layer called reduced graphing. In addition to our live mosquito experiments, we also tested the physical ability of tiny needles to puncture our graphing materials, and we had a com computer simulation to find out if mosquito mouth parts had enough strength to penetrate the graphing. You can see in figure, figure one, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes on a patch of bare skin in our lab. Exposing bare skin to the mosquitoes provided our control case. The yellow arrows indicate biting behaviors. Results. Excitingly, we found that the thin graphene layer under the cheesecloth prevented mosquitoes from biting people. Mosquitoes never bit through it and no swellings developed. Figure two. Bare skin got the most mosquito bites, about 16 on average, followed by skin only covered by cheesecloth, about five bites per five minute exposure. Mosquitoes also landed fewer times and spent less time overall on the skin covered with graphene. On naked skin or skin covered in cheesecloth, the mosquitoes landed about 23 times on average and stayed for one to two minutes. In comparison, fewer than 10 mosquitoes on average landed on the graphene layer and they stayed there for much shorter periods. Our bite force experiments with needles as well as our computer simulation confirmed that mosquitoes do not have enough force to bite through the dry graphene layer. Please see figure two, page three. Figure two, average number of mosquito bites per square inch in a five minute time period on three different materials, naked skin, cheesecloth, and graphene layer on cheesecloth. Discussion. Graphene was clearly effective at preventing mosquito bites. We were also struck by how much less skin the mosquitoes landed on, sorry, how much less the mosquitoes landed on graphene covered skin. It looked as if they did not even try to bite through the graphene. This told us that something else was going on. What if the graphene also blocked chemical signals from the skin that the mosquitoes needed for locating their victims? We wanted to be sure, so we applied water or sweat on top of the graphene layer. All of a sudden, the mosquitoes landed again and started to bite through the material. This tells us two things. One, the dry graphene is likely also keeping mosquitoes off by keeping necessary chemical cues from reaching the mosquito. Two, water or sweat breaks down the graphene layer and makes it penetrable for mosquitoes. Luckily, luckily, we could restore the chemical and physical barrier by slightly altering the graphene material which reduce mosquito bites in both dry and wet conditions. However, this ver version of graphene is le less breathable than our original graphene material. We hope that our research will inspire others to make graphene co covered clothes that do not let mosquito bites through, even in wet and humid conditions, but are still breathable and comfortable to wear. Conclusion. Even though mosquitoes are just trying to feed themselves, the diseases they sometimes carry can seriously harm us. The best protection from getting sick is not to get is to not get bitten at all. Wear protective clothing when in mosquito prone areas. It is better to wear long sleeves and pants even if you don't have graphene layer clothing. Sleep under a mosquito net. Tip away all standing water where mosquitoes lay their eggs. When traveling to mosquito prone areas, make sure you take the right medication and use appropriate repellent. And then here's a glossary. And at the check your understanding, some questions, and then references for where they got their information. So that was quite a bit. And remember, this was actually written by adults for teens. So it was in much more detail um, and much more complicated than the experiments we're doing. But it gave you a sense of all the different parts and what those parts mean. So let's take a look at the list. So they had a title, an abstract, introduction, methods, results discussion. Now they also had a conclusion, but we're, we don't need that because a discussion pretty much is our conclusion. Uh, we're going to have acknowledgments, literature cited, and figures and tables. For today, we're going to focus on the method section. This describes your specific techniques and your overall experimental strategy. So this was their methods. This is where they asked volunteers to be bitten and they described it bit by bit. So for your experiment, this is something you've actually already done. So in your experiment proposal, you've already described it in detail. 
basically you just have to take this and turn it into paragraph form. So that's why it was really important you did a, made a great proposal because it saves work for you now. The next section is results. That's what we're going to really focus on today. Their results was a combination of their graph, so you can see the different data, and explaining the graph, explaining um, basically what the graph is saying. So for us, we're going to learn how to take your data, turn it into a graph, and how to write it up. 